This meeting is being recorded. All right, so we, we have more people registered. We, we're we're going to have a really good turnout today. It uh, looks like about half of the folks that registered are on already. Um, so we will just kick it off. Um, my name is Anthony Heinz Fritz. I'm the vice president and uh, president elect of the um, Financial Planning Association of Central New York. And um, today we're doing um, our, our, our monthly meeting in, in conjunction with the Central New York Community Foundation. And uh, we're just really um, happy to have uh, our members and also non-members attend. Uh, we, try, we try to do, what we do is actually monthly, we have um, meetings like this. Typically we have um, in, uh, luncheons and then we also offer uh, the option to attend virtually. And um, we are committed to offering great content and networking opportunities for uh, people in the financial planning profession and, and, and the allied professions in the central New York area. Um, um, I'd also so you know definitely thank you to Central New York uh, Community Foundation and, and Vanguard for putting this together. Um, I also want to highlight our June event. On June 7th, we have a full day event where we have thought leaders in our industry come out, provide uh, educational uh, workshops and presentations. Uh, we have, it's a great opportunity to network. It's a be beautiful venue at the Lodge in Scania Atlas on June 7th. If you have um, any questions about how you could attend that, um, members and non-members are welcome. Um, if you're a member, you get in for free. Um, reach out to admin at cny, uh, uh, or sorry, admin at fpacny.org. That's admin at fpacny.org. And uh, that's how you can inquire about all of our upcoming events and also uh, the June event on June 7th. Um, the sponsor for our June event is uh, Phil Martin. He's, the, uh, he, he's with MFS Investment. And uh, he's our platinum sponsor for this year's annual event in June. Um, so what I want to do is I want to introduce you guys to Tom Griffith and also Pragya Murphy with uh, Central New York um, Community Foundation. Tom is a VP of Development. Pragya is a Development Officer. And they're also members of the Financial Planning Association. Tom is actually a past board member. Uh, so we really appreciate all he's done for our chapter in the past. And, and whenever they put together, I know, I know Pragya has worked hard to put this together. Um, whenever, whenever we coordinate with them, it's always a great event. It's a great topic. Uh, uh, thanks to Vanguard as well for being here. Um, so with that being said, I want to hand it off to Tom and Pragya. Thanks so much, Anthony. I appreciate that introduction. And so I just wanted to start by welcoming everybody that's on the call. We have, um, uh, you know, as Anthony said, this is the FPA's, you know, monthly luncheon for February. So we have a number of financial Planning Association members, we have other professional advisors, and we also have donors to the Community Foundation. And so I wanted to welcome everybody. Um, you know, all of those groups that I just mentioned are very important to the Community Foundation because it's really how we make connections in our community. So it's by existing donors talking about, you know, how they interact with the Community Foundation and their and their fund here. It's it's professional advisors connecting with their clients when they have opportunities for charitable planning. Um, and so in that vein, you know, every year we try to put together uh, events and webinars like this one that help advance that sort of cause of, you know, charitable planning in our community. Um, this is the third uh, part in a series that we did this year entitled Let's Talk Philanthropy. Uh, began last spring, and continued into the fall. It was uh, how to talk about charitable planning. It was some examples of charitable planning tools and techniques. And now we're bringing it sort of, you know, to the next level when we're talking about holistic planning, intergenerational wealth planning, and how that uh, uh, works into the context of charitable planning. Um, you know, so much of what we do at the Community Foundation, you know, is around lifetime giving and the tools associated with that. Um, but really, our mission is focused on permanence and creating permanent legacy that will support our local area um, uh, and stewarding those legacies as we move, move through um, uh, over time. And so one of the things I just wanted to share with you quickly is just a short video that sort of talks about that legacy planning work. And it highlights uh, one of our attendees that's on, the, on with us today. So give me one second and I will um, hopefully make one of the reasons that we like to give back is you want to see the place that was so good to you continue to flourish. In general, if you start to look across all demographics of Central New York, you will find that people are very, very open to helping others who are in need, but also to thinking forward 
toward the needs that may be coming down the pike. You've grown up here. You've earned money here. You've socialized here. Perhaps you raised your family here. How about leaving a small piece of your earned money to your favorite charity and also establishing some sort of legacy to continue a stream of income to that charity? I would suggest to everyone when you're looking at your estate plan, don't stop to just look at the mechanics, but what are the dreams that you would like to fuel for the future and using your estate plan to do so? Definitely talk to someone at Community Foundation because they have a lot of resources available for just general information and knowledge and then getting to that next step of how do you plan for the future and for your legacy. It's important that people think about what values do they want their children to have. And by giving from their estate or planning from their estate and allowing their children to know about that, they're presenting values to them that are really critical. We all want to believe that we have all the answers, but the Community Foundation and organizations like this are charged with digging deeply into communities to really identify the needs that are going to need to be funded now and in the future. It feels good, you know, it feels good to look out and know that your money, your funds is making a difference in our community. In a way, it is just carrying forth how you lived your life and to carry it forth while you are gone. We have an opportunity in Central New York to turn our hopes for the future into reality. Over the next decade, more than 40% of our region's wealth will be changing hands from one generation to the next. But if 5% was designated for local charities in a charitable endowment, more than $50 million would be available for nonprofit grant making each year, creating a permanent source of funding that will greatly improve the lives of our family, friends, and future generations. So with that as the sort of backdrop, I just will, I will thank FPA again for having us be a part of their monthly meeting. Um, I also thank Vanguard for being our presenters. Um, and I also just wanna also welcome, there may be some members here of, of other FPA chapters. This was shared nationally. And I think, uh, you know, regardless of where you're sitting right now in what community, there's a community foundation near you and an FPA chapter that you're in, you know, that can probably, um, you know, fulfill all of these same sort of um, uh, things that we're talking about. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to Pragya to make the introductions of our speakers. So. Great, thanks, Tom. Um, welcome everyone. I'm Pragya Murphy, Development Officer here at the Community Foundation. I work with professional advisors in the Central New York region, serving as a resource for charitable planning for their clients. Um, before we get uh, started here, I just wanted to go over some logistics for today's presentation. Please show your name and your firm on the screen. We'll have the audience on mute during the seminar. Dara Harper uh, is our events associate. She'll be running the seminar. Uh, and please let her know if you're having any technical issues. Um, please type in your questions for our panelists in the chat box throughout the seminar and we'll try to address them accordingly. Just to let you know, we are recording this seminar for later viewing and sharing. Um, thanks to the Financial Planning Association of Central New York, one hour of CFP credit will be provided. You'll need to stay on this um, entire seminar in order to receive the credit. Um, and now I would like to introduce the speakers from Vanguard. Um, we're so grateful to partner with FPA CNY and Vanguard to hold this lunch and learn for you all today. First, we have Heather Winslow Walker. She's a, Heather is a family legacy specialist for Vanguard Ultra High Net Worth Clients. In this work, Heather helps clients prepare family members to receive the assets as wealth transfers across generations. She helps clients plan the emotional legacy they want to leave their family, including their values, stories, and traditions. This foundation complements the financial planning process to ensure an integrated approach to wealth planning. 
Next, we have Brad Spiegler. Uh, he's a CFA and is a regional sales executive in Vanguard's Financial Advisor Services. Brad works directly with registered investment advisors in the Northeast and is responsible for developing new relationships, maintaining and broadening existing relationships, marketing Vanguard investment products and thought leadership, providing practice management solutions that help advisors grow their business. Last but not least, um, we have Richard Horn. Richard Horn is a sales executive for Vanguard Financial Advisor Services, where he's responsible for building and maintaining strategic relationships with registered investment advisors in the Northeast region. Um, now I will let the panelists start their presentation. Thank you. And hello, everyone. As Pragya has said, my name is Heather Winslow Walker, and I um, have been at Vanguard for about 20 years. Uh, just quickly to add to Pragya's, um, to Pragya's intro, I've been at Vanguard about 20 years and started the Family Legacy Unit uh, five years ago at Vanguard. And um, I have a background in psychology education, coaching, and I'm a certified family legacy specialist. So I work with our individual clients every day to, uh, to help them to be thinking about just the issues that were brought up during that uh, video. And I'm gonna allow my um, advisor partners here, Brad and Richard, to just say a few words before we kick off. Brad, can I turn it to you real quick? Sure, Heather, thanks. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Really excited to be here alongside Heather and Richard and, and the team at the Community Foundation and uh, the FPA. So as, uh, as Pragya mentioned, I work with uh, registered investment advisors in uh, the Northeast, uh, New York State and New England. Uh, saw some familiar names on the uh, uh, who joined. So great to uh, great to see you all again. And uh, look forward to the presentation. And uh, you know, I know we'll get there. But if there are follow up uh, from more of the advisors in the audience, feel free to reach out to uh, to Richard and myself. And and thanks again for having us, Richard. Great, thanks, Brad. Um, it is great to see a lot of familiar names, and I think it is truly Vanguard's honor and privilege to you know offer this presentation out to you in partnership um, with FPA and Community Foundation. Um, Look, this is real important stuff, and we are very lucky to have Heather present this. She is truly a rock star here at Vanguard. I think you guys are going to take away some great stuff from this. Um, for those of you who we don't know, I look forward to hopefully meeting you real soon. And if you could uh, have that snow melt for me before I get there, I'd greatly appreciate it. So with that, uh, both me and Brad are going to hop on mute and, and hand it over uh, to today's presenter, Heather. Well, thanks, um, thanks, Richard. And I think my slides are coming up a little bit slow as, as we get started here. So just bear with me if I have to uh, pause a moment. I'll be taking the lead during the presentation and then we'll be bringing Brad and Richard back on for the Q&A because as we said, we, we serve different clients at Vanguard and we wanna be able to meet your needs uh, for those that are on the presentation. Now today, as we begin to talk about intergenerational wealth planning, our agenda is going to be to be to, to discuss what is it, what does it involve, why does it matter, and how do I do it? And we're going to be switching during the presentation between an advisor view as well as a donor view. Okay, and that really covers the different client bases that Richard, um, Richard, and Brad and I all work with at Vanguard. Now, when we think about holistic wealth management planning and being prepared for the future, we always talk to clients that it really is about three different main components. And I'll also be bringing the philanthropy in in just a moment, but bear with me here. So we think about it from the financial planning side. So that's what many of you in this audience do, right? Working with a client's investments to be able to help them to meet their future goals, whether they be... Um, for a particular lifestyle or philanthropy or to pass things to their children. You also need to think about holistic wealth planning from the estate planning side. I and mean, I know that we have some um, probably estate planning lawyers, tax accountants in the office or in the uh, audience today, thinking about it from the perspective of what legal structures do I need in place to be able to pass wealth successfully. And finally, you have to be able to think about it from the family legacy planning side. 
We often call that the people side of wealth transfer. And we almost think of this like a three-legged stool. If you don't have all pieces of this, the stool can fall down. And when we think about that family legacy planning, which is often a left outside of this holistic wealth management planning, we think about it from three angles. It really means to us, how are we brokering communication as a family or in a family if I'm an advisor? How am I educating beneficiaries on investment and wealth management topics and how am I preparing people for future roles, whether that might mean a tactical role like an executor or a trustee, or whether that means that I'm a charitable steward of my family's legacy over time. And so we think about it from those three perspectives. Now, this takes the, the graphic that I showed before, that three-legged stool, and just begins to take it a little bit deeper. And we like to call this concept the family bank. And these are all the things, again, that a family needs to be thinking about as they prepare for the future. So again, you saw in, you, you see in this bank, similar to the previous graphic, those financial assets are key. The estate planning is key. But we also, you can also see here that the philanthropy is key. It's another component of that holistic wealth management planning. And you'll see that the foundation of all that planning really gets to the family legacy planning, all right? And when we start with family legacy planning, one of our main or our first areas of attack, and this came up in, in the video, is what values does a family have? And that might seem like kind of an odd question when we're so used to dealing with the numbers and you know, being a Vanguard 20 years, for me, it was always about, you know, that we're focused on the investments and the financial end of our clients' portfolios. But when we think, start to think about what does the people side look like? What are those values? Because if you think about it, our values determine how we spend our money, what we're investing for, how we shape our planning. So for example, one, a couple of my values are hard work and education. And I'm willing to spend my money on education for myself and for my children. As I plan for my estate, hard work might be a caveat to people receiving that wealth or benefiting from that wealth. So again, we always say that values are the cornerstone of, of family legacy planning it's almost like values are to family legacy, like asset allocation is to, is, is to investments. It's that critical. So that really gets back to or answers the first part of our agenda. What is intergenerational wealth planning? It's a holistic look, looking at a wealth plan from not only the financial, the estate side, but also the family legacy side, also thinking about the people. But you know, why, why should we bother with this? Why, why does it really matter? And again, I'll talk about this from both the, the individual donor perspective as well as the advisor perspective. You may have heard, and it's pretty commonly cited, that very often by the second generation, it's often 70% of families are at risk of losing their wealth or their inheritance. And by the third generation, that number is at 90%. And as the researchers, and this was done by Williams and Prizer, as the researchers started to drill down into that, and again, these are pretty common statistics, so I'm probably not telling you anything that you haven't heard before, 60% is due to a breakdown of trust, a breakdown of communication within the family. 25% is due to people who just aren't prepared to take on that inheritance. And 10% is due to a lack of a common family vision or mission, okay? Very often the parents might be doing their planning and just kind of moving it down the chain without much conversation around, does this vision feel compelling to all of us? Whereas only 5% is due to 
a lack of uh, estate planning or a misstep in estate planning or the taxes that might get at you. And so this is very interesting data in the sense that as much effort, and I see it within my client's base, as much effort as our clients put into financial planning and estate planning, and not to discredit those, they are very critical to that three-legged stool that I talked about. It's the human elements that might start to make an inheritance fall down over the generations. Okay. And again, these are pretty common stats, but let me start to put this into context with a personal example. And I actually have some roots up in central New York. So my in-law family has a cottage in Lake Canandaigua. My mother-in-law grew up there and really feels this deep connection to that community. And so we as a family gather at this cottage every summer. And that is the value that that cottage represents, that that piece of asset represents. It represents family. And a few years ago, my in-laws were starting to put their estate planning in place and they decided that they wanted to pass this cottage to the children. They have three children. I'm married to the eldest son. And so they asked, hey, can we just stop over after dinner and have you sign some paperwork? And they did, and my husband dutifully signed, and that was about the extent of it. They were in kind of 15 minutes in and out with the signature on this paperwork, and suddenly we become involved in this cottage and owning, owning it. But there was no other talk about it besides that. And so what started to happen is over the course of two years, this all started to brew. And behind the scenes, people were asking, what, is, what does this mean? And am, am I financially responsible for this now? And so you can see how the lack of communication really leads to a breakdown in the estate plans that were thought that were so well thought through. Even though we've been going up to that cottage for 20 years, we've never helped to open it. We've never helped to close it. We're very responsible, but <laughs> we just have never taken the effort to do that. We don't know how to maintain that cottage. We don't know how to pay the taxes. So we as beneficiaries are unprepared to take this, this estate over seamlessly. And what was also brewing behind the scenes was this talk around, do I want this cottage? I think I do want to own this. I think I would rather rent this among, among the family members. And so you can see how a very practical, simple issue starts to get very blown up and puts that inheritance at risk. And again, while I might work with ultra high net worth clients, I would say the asset range that we were dealing with here was really in the high net worth uh, arena. And in addition, it could go down to mass affluent. I also see it in that work. So it's really, while not all families will pass a legacy across generations, all families need to be prepared for some type of transfer or um, changing responsibilities in the future. So that's really from the individual donor perspective as to why it's important to be having this, this family legacy conversation because all of the work that we put into the technical can begin to fall down. And from an advisor perspective, what this chart begins to show is that the higher value that a client, uh, in terms of client perception, comes as we begin to offer services that are more personalized. That's what you see in the upper right-hand corner. And it's things like talking about the family and their business or their charitable giving or their estate planning and trust services with things that can't be commoditized. Now, do these conversations get messy? I, I get that a lot, the dynamics that you must work with, Heather. And I, I would say I certainly do, but I would say on a month's basis of working with clients every day that it might be one to two instances a month. And instead, what I'm trying to frame here is that the value of stepping into conversations that might feel just a little bit out of our wheelhouse can add tremendous value and really retain that, that, that relationship over time. 
And it's key, right? Again, these are stats that as advisors, we probably know um, very, uh, very top of mind is that 68 trillion, and actually this was just updated by Cerulli um, in January of 2022, it's actually 84 trillion is gonna transfer over the next 20 years. And so when we think about our books, no matter what size of book we manage, whether it's, whether it's 10 million, 50 million, 100 million plus, we have to begin thinking, what would a 30% reduction in our business do if the next generation began to leave our services and look elsewhere? Or even if we thought, what if we lost a few of our top clients? And so that really makes getting into this space really important. And just to continue to highlight that data from, um, from Cerulli, again, this has changed a little bit just in January, 2022. What they were originally predicting is that a spike would happen in the transfer starting around 2038. So at Vanguard, we were thinking, yeah, we're gonna be focusing on this, but we have you know, 15, 20 years. Well, the more recent data shows that it's actually going to be a smoother glide path. It's going to be, um, it's going to, the, the amount of wealth that is going to be equal across the five-year periods that is transferring, and that we're about on the verge of a spike here. And so as we head into the next one to five years in 2023, we're going to start to see an increase of $8 trillion beginning to transfer in the industry, which puts some of those assets at risk and what can we do to begin to capture those. Again, stats that you might be familiar with, and again, I'll put this in the context of a personal story, but often a spouse, um, perhaps a wife, 70% of the time might not stay with an investor or 87% of the time children won't stay with an advisor, excuse me. And I already talked about that last column where from an individual perspective, you know, 70% of um, instances, a, a inheritance won't pass successfully. But just to put this in a personal context, um, again, I'm pretty passionate about this topic and about being prepared. And so this summer I was working with my mother on her estate and I, I'm her executor. And I was working, we were working each week to tackle a different thing. So getting the accounts organized, reading through the, the legal documents so I would know what to do, going to the bank to make sure that would be a smooth transition. And one of the things on our checklist was that we wanted to talk to her advisor, who she's been with for 20 years. Her name is Lori. And we called her up and just, and just explained that, hey, we were trying to get prepared for the future and just wanted to um, ask her some questions that I was going to be the executor and trying to kind of make sure that I was um, that I was prepared for that role. And her response was, boy, you, you ladies are like way, way over prepared. You're like way overthinking this. And I said, well, you know, I, I, I do this work every day and it's really important to us. We've had some instances in our family where we've seen it. it hasn't gone well. We'd like to get ahead of this. And so I said, I just started to ask some basic questions about my mom's account. And I said, so can you just explain, um, just so I can understand um, from a perspective of what, what's her asset allocation? And the response was, um, you know, stocks and bonds. And I'm not kind of kidding you when I say that. And I said, okay, like 50-50 or, you know, and, and she finally told me the allocation and, you know, we continued down the, the conversation. And um, I said, so what age do you um, plan for when you're planning? Cause we're really looking at the duration of, of this account. My mom's in the mass affluent um, uh, sector. And I said, at Vanguard, you know, we, I know that our advisors plan till age 99. Is that what you do? And she said, that is so morbid. And I, I, you know, I kid you not that this is how this conversation was. That, that is so morbid. I, I, can't, I can't believe that you, that you want to talk about that. And so when we got off the phone, you know, I called my mom and I said, did, did I do something in that conversation? Like, I don't, I don't know what went wrong there. And, um, and I said, I won't tell you to leave her. 
And she said, good, because I wouldn't. But I said, I, she will not be in getting any of my inherited money. I will pull it out of there that quickly. And the funny thing is, is that I trust this, this advisor to manage my mom's money. I think she's done well by her. But I don't trust her to manage the relationship with me. And she had an opportunity that day to capture those assets just by how she worked with me. And that really is starts to lead us into thinking about how, how are we showing up as we begin to interact with the families and with the people within these relationships. So we've talked about the what, what intergenerational wealth planning is, that holistic approach. We've talked about why it's important because assets are, are at risk, even from an individual perspective, as well as an advisor perspective, but how do we begin to do it? And again, I'll approach this from an advisor perspective first, and then start to turn it over to how we think about it as individual donors as well. So I don't know about you, but if you're like Vanguard, and I see this every day, we tend to um, we tend to look at our books by AUM size. We tend to segment our books by AUM size. And we begin to think about how do we go, how do we serve those clients in those particular asset segments? But what if we, and knowing that data is hard to get, but what if we began to flip some of that segmentation a little bit differently? What if we began to think about it in terms of family size, or if we began to think about it in terms of age or the multiple generations or even gender or the location where people are at? What if we began to look at our books? What would it reveal to us about different ways to go after that book to not only preserve us or uh, maintain us for the, the, current, our, our, the current time, but to preserve us across time. And as we begin to segment that book, it might start to tell us some gaps or some opportunities in how we're looking at our different segments. Okay. So even this first, I, um, this, this first point, like determining our, our engagement level with different clients. And I think the graphic above that is very key, okay, because it's not unusual for me to say to our relationship managers, how would you rate the engagement of your, of your current client base? And you're, they're usually like thumbs up, everything's good, the trust is built. But if I flip that question and I begin to say, what's your engagement level with the next generation? And that, that graphic kind of shows looking beyond the, the main client to the next generation, the beneficiaries. And the answer starts to change. You know, I'm not quite sure. Can we begin to get more specific about what that family makeup does and begin to think through how can we use tools that we might have at our disposal today to reach them? How can we turn those into opportunities? Because as we highlighted, the opportunity among young investors, I mean, it's not unusual for me, as, especially as I'm working with mass affluent clients, for us to uncover that the children may have more assets than even our main client does. And so how do we use that and continue to build that trust to be able to ascertain where that opportunity is? And, what, and as I cited that first uh, statistic a, a couple slides back that showed that about 70% of spouses will leave the advisor. And the question is, how many, how, how often are we really getting that spouse on the phone? And I don't know about your organization, but you know, it's not unusual for me to hear like we can sometimes get them on the phone for the initial meeting, but do we, do we get them to stick consistently? Or they might come in and say, hi, and then, hey, I have to go. And the answer that we have found is that 
you have to talk about something that they are interested in. And that might not be rocket science, but in my experience, it's not unusual. This isn't a hundred percent rule, but it's not unusual that the spouse, whether that be the husband or the wife who isn't the main financial manager in the family, isn't particularly interested in our investment conversations and our expertise as we're kind of flouting that out. The main financial manager is, but the person inheriting may not be. Now, that doesn't mean that we have to talk about hobbies or vacations per se. That's not the way to get them sticky either. You have to talk to them about something that is value added to them that is within your world. And the thing that we do find that spouses are interested in is being prepared. They may not want to talk about the nitty gritty of the investment allocation or um, the returns that came in or the latest ETF but they are interested in knowing that things are prepared for them. And as you're willing to engage in those conversations, it's really the trust that will keep them here as this, as this shows, you know, just as an example, you know, I was working with a relationship manager um, who had had a deep uh, relationship with, um, with a client. It happened to be the husband who was the main financial manager for eight years. And he, as we prepared, for a conversation where we were bringing the spouse in, he said, you know what? I really haven't talked to the spouse in these eight years. And so we went about doing some family preparation conversations over the course of two meetings. And one of the things that we were trying to get to at the end is how could the relationship manager and the spouse continue to connect? And the spouse actually said at the end of that, you know what, I think I do feel comfortable calling Jeremy now. I wouldn't have before, but I do feel comfortable now because we were willing to go where she needed to go. Okay. And so really from an advisor perspective, how you do this is how can you slice and dice that book differently? How can you look for opportunity in the book and how can you begin to add benefit to, um, to the beneficiaries in ways that you already have at your fingertips? I know we concentrated a lot on the spouse, but a great way with children is through education. Do you have any educational tools at your disposal that you can begin to educate them on investment or wealth management concepts? Um, as, and that's a great tactic within the 20s. In the 30s, can you begin to talk to them about their own level of preparation, particularly as they start having kids, they get more interested in that. In the 40s, can you begin to talk to them about preparing for their parents' advancing life stages and what role might they need to play? And so again, it's about thinking of what is a value add topic that's still within my scope, that's still within my realm that I can begin to share. So that's really from the advisor perspective about how you do or how you begin to approach family legacy, but how about from an individual perspective. And actually, um, I'll talk to the individual donors here mostly in this section, but these are some great questions, whether you're an advisor or an individual. What, you know, what wealth planning has been done to date? Is there a will? Is it up to date? Is there an estate plan? Is there a trust? Do you have everything covered that you need to be thinking about? How, how have you communicated to family? For the individual donor to be thinking about, have I started to communicate this to family? And I'll give you some tips in just a minute for that. And, at, and advisors asking families that question. This third one is a great one. How prepared is your family to receive wealth? And you'll often get a plethora of information back from that. And if they aren't prepared, is there a reason? And I'll get to some common objections you might hear for that and ways to respond as we, as we near the end of the presentation. But from a donor perspective, and a lot of this will echo some of the things that we heard in the video, ways that you begin to um, prepare your family legacy, and I'm gonna put a, a tilt of the charitable legacy um, here, are very much things, and I'll drill down into these in just a minute, but you do want to start with those values. 
you want to identify your, your common charitable connection as a family while still giving some flexibility. And I'll give you an idea of how that other pe that people might have some different ideas around that. Define your mission. And I'll show you how to actually do a quick hit of writing a mission statement so that the family feels focused. And then how do you involve others? How do you prepare others to play roles in your ongoing charitable legacy? And if I can start with just that, again, sharing the, the values, sorry, my slides are going a little bit crazy here. Let's see if that sticks. It doesn't, my slides keep pulling around. Okay, here we go. So if you think about sharing the values, just some really good questions to be reflecting on is starting out of what stories and experiences really shaped me in my life? And often those stories and experiences really lead to the different values that you might have. Or if you're thinking about your values, what is it that I feel so strongly? What is it that I believe in? And very often our clients will say things like hard work, education, spirituality, giving back, kindness. Those are some of the most common values that we hear. Asking ourselves some of these questions, how did, uh, what is the purpose of my wealth? And how did I acquire my wealth? And if we think about it, particularly in the context, let's just say of central New York, since that's the, uh, where our main presentation is going to today, how did they build that wealth within the central New York community? What legacy do we want to give back to the place where it was built? and vision, what role would I see my family be playing within this legacy that I want to promote? What positive impact do I want to make on society? So these are all great questions. We call it the family story for you to ponder individually. And it's a great way to enter into um, a conversation with a family around the legacy that you want to leave, because very often one of the objections, and I'll kind of cite this a little bit later on, but very often one of the objections we hear is, I don't want to tell my kids the amount of money that I have. I don't want to disincentivize them. And that's perfectly valid. And I'll tell you, it's very rare in the work I do that as I'm leading family meetings or working with families that I ever talk about the assets. You can start to prepare somebody without necessarily always revealing the amount of the assets until they're ready, until there's a time for that. And talking about your stories and your values are a great way to begin to ease into that conversation. I was just working with a client this past month who happened to be a, um, he was 92 and he had a, he was a big contributor in Fort Wayne. I think that's Indiana, if I'm not mistaken. In fact, so much so that they call him Mr. Fort Wayne. And I was preparing to have a family meeting and I did what pre-calls with each of the children, the children, um, three daughters were in their sixties. And they all knew how important charitable giving was to their father, but they all lived in different locations. They did not live in Fort Wayne. And they knew that he would want them to take this on, but they weren't sure how they were gonna pull that off living in different locations. And so bringing them together for a family meeting and understanding his wishes, he did wanna to give to Fort Wayne, but he talked about perhaps creative ways that even though they didn't live there, could they begin to still give back to that community? Could they, um, could they have a family board that guided a board that was on location in Fort Wayne? If at some point they wanted to disband their foundation, could they uh, give the money to the Fort Wayne Community Foundation to be able to do good works there? So again, thinking about it from the perspective of where did I, where did I build this well? What contribution do I want to make back to the community that supported me during those years? And how do I begin to bring my family in? Now, as I was having those pre-calls for a family meeting, the anxiety was high, okay? Because they were like, I don't know what's going on. I don't know how to, to make this happen. But just that communication, okay? We didn't talk about the amount of the wealth during that family meeting. Just being able to open up the dialogue 
started to get people on the same page, started to decrease the anxiety and started to get them focused on how they would uh, continue to move forward with this, even though they didn't leave in that, uh, live in that particular area. And another great way is to really identify your charitable connection. And so this is just a, a really simple activity that we have found pretty successful. We call it our charitable placemat. And um, what it is, is that you have a placemat that has those arrows on the bottom. And then each of those icons at the top are like little chips, little, little placards that you can move around. And it's a great um, family activity to have each member have a placemat and to put the things that are most important to them or to lay them out along this continuum. And it can start to do two things. It can start to say, what does the family have in common from a charitable connection? What are those places that we wanna to give to together? And it might also start to reveal the individual differences that people have, which is fine. So it uh, begins to get in a family's mind. This is what we're gonna to do together. And this is where if I'm doled some of my individual money or even on my own, I might choose to support um, as an or uh, on my own because these this reflects my values. Mm -hmm. Another great tactic, um, and it will sound a little cheesy. My, oh, there we go. Um, but it really does work is having a family put together a mission statement. And in this case, it's a charitable mission statement. And what's really key is two components here. Again, going back to those values, all the words that I have um, highlighted in teal here are all of this family's values. And this is an actual mission statement um, from a family that I worked with. And the second paragraph gets them thinking about what is the purpose of our wealth? What is the purpose of our charitable giving in this particular case? And so leading families through activities where they are able to identify their values, identify their, their purpose of their wealth, and then to craft that into two to three sentences might sound cheesy, but I routinely hear from beneficiaries, boy, that was really helpful because it helped me to focus. Before I walked in here, I didn't know what, what we were doing. I didn't know what, what I was supposed to carry out. This gives me focus. And then finally, involving others in that. And so a big part, when we talked about, remember at the beginning, that air beneficiaries are not always prepared to take on a role. And whether that role um, is more tactical as part of your estate plan, whether it's an executor or a trustee, or whether it is to be a charitable steward, as outlined here on this slide with just some suggested roles, it's really important to identify who will do what what strengths do each family members have that would contribute to them being able to, to help out? So for example, in my family, I have a bit more of the financial perspective. My sister is a nurse practitioner. So based on those strengths, we are very clear on who will do what with my, mother, um, with my mother's care as she begins to get into advanced life stages. This, this is similar from a, a charitable perspective. Who will be the charitable liaison? Who, um, who will go out and um, who will run the board meetings, et cetera, are just different roles that people can begin to play. Okay. So hopefully that we covered the, the how you do it with you, even either from an individual advisor perspective or, or, from, an in, or from an individual donor perspective. Just some final last tips as we begin to wrap up here. One of the easiest ways that I have found to transitioning into these conversations is to use the concept of preparation, of being prepared as a family, as a frame for going into these conversations. If you just start to enter it with, hey, what do you want your family legacy to be? That can be a little bit overwhelming often for, um, often for clients. But if you take this frame of, what level of preparation have you done with your estate, with your final plans, um, and discussing the, the benefits of, of that type of preparation um, for, um, as part of your wealth planning, preparing the people um, so that they are prepared in the case of an emergency. 
people are often more willing to kind of enter that. They'll often talk about how um, they either think they're very well prepared or that they, um, that they haven't thought about it at all. And even if they say, I think we're good, I think we're very well prepared, asking some well-poised questions such as, when was the last time you updated your will? Have you communicated to your family? Is your family prepared to be an executor? Are they prepared to be a trustee? And often they'll say things like, yeah, we've told them. And again, that's one of those like 15 minutes sit around the dinner table, you're gonna be the executor. And the kid says, of course, yeah, sure, I'll help you out there. But they have no idea what that means or how, how to do that. And so the more value add you can give them, um, if you write to Brad and Richard at the end, we have a couple of tools. We'll get, we'll, we'll pass on our email addresses um, in the follow-up email, but we have a couple of tools that can help to ease you into that preparedness discussion. Here's a preparedness assessment that both spouses can take that can begin to really show how prepared are they. Um, also, just their critical financial checklist um, to make sure that they have all of their planning documents in place good way to ease in to get them to think through, have we really thought through everything? I know that often as we do this work, we often think about those objections and very often the objections are around privacy. Um, perhaps our beneficiaries aren't prepared enough, they're too young. Um, perhaps I don't wanna touch this because of the different family dynamics. And ways that you can begin to overcome those are, um, are things like, all of those concerns are valid, but not talking about them isn't going to, to solve them or isn't going to prepare the family. Um, yeah, it's valid that you don't want to talk, that, that maybe you don't want to talk to someone in their early 20s about the amount of wealth because you want to see them more established in their careers, but you can still do education. You can still um, start to get them prepared until that time when they're ready to take on more in-depth conversations. Um, another objection that we might hear is, my kids uh, don't wanna talk about that. Often your kids do, and we often feel them feeling anxious, particularly as they're in their 40s and we haven't talked about any of this, that they wanna talk about these things. So just good, um, good ways to handle some of those object, object, objections. And so as we end today, just be thinking about how are, we, how are we looking at that book differently? How are we thinking about different ways to, to slice and dice that book, to uncover opportunity? How are we preparing our clients for the future? And for the, our individual donors in the audience, how much have we really checked in on our comprehensive planning? And at the very least, have we begun to communicate that to our children? Before I turn it back over to Pragi, it was, a, it was a pleasure speaking with you today. I hope that from this, you began to understand what intergenerational wealth planning is and how we think about it, why it's so critical. And just even if you get one tip on how to do it a little bit differently, then I'll consider this a success. But I'll turn it over to uh, Pragi now for any questions for our panel. If anyone has any questions right now, please, uh, um, I think there is a feature, raise your hand in Zoom or post it in the chat. Um, if not, um, we'll just wait a couple more minutes. It was, it was just a powerful presentation. What an important message for advisors and uh, donors as well. So thank you, Heather, that was great. Yeah, I'd also just like to, echo that thought. Um, Heather, you just covered a lot of ground. Um, you know, when you mentioned, you know, there's steps you can take to sort of ease into this work. Um, I'll just add that, you know, from the very beginning of our charitable legacy work that we do with donors, you know, we use discernment and values conversations. We ask those same questions that you went through. Um, and as you talked about, that's the basis for really, you know, all three legs of the stool, you know, the financial plan, the estate plan, the family plan. And, um, you know, this, this legacy plan that we create for the charitable piece, you know, you know can be, you know, um, you know, shared back with the advisor. We can help facilitate next steps with interacting with, 
you know, families and engaging the next generation. So as I think about, um, you know, an easy way to, to, you know, step into this work, you know, I think it is, you know, reaching out to um, not only experts like you at Vanguard, but also, you know, your local community foundation, and in this case, you know, the Central New York Community Foundation, you know, can be a, a great resource for being able to, you know, start that conversation in a way that, you know, hits those, those family values and the things that are important um, to all pieces of the, of the plan. So, and again, I, I just wanted to say thank you for sharing that, that content. You know, it was uh, um, wonderful to have that aggregated and, and shared with, you know, all of the donors and the advisors that are on this call today. So um, I don't know if Brad and Richard have things they want to want to add in here too. Um, I'm not seeing currently any any questions in the um, chat other than the handout will be will be made available, um, you know, and share with the presentation um, and, and video. So, yep. Yes, um, the presentation and the video will be shared. Um, Dara will send that out probably tomorrow um, with everything, but feel free to um, email us, any of us, Tom um, Griffith here and Jan Lane and uh, myself, um, reach out to us how we can help your clients here within the Central New York Community Foundation. And as far as the CFP credit, th those of you here um, who are seeking that one hour CFP credit, um, we will administer that through FPA CNY. Um, and uh, if you don't receive that within the next uh, couple of weeks, you know, please reach out to me or um, at admin um, at uh, what was the email? I think uh, admin at fpacny.org. So. Yes, thank you, Tom. Um, well, I, I hope you enjoyed yeah. the presentation. Um, I'm definitely going to share this with my parents and my. <laughs> You do have a question that just came in too. Uh, David Contagulia asks, as clients migrate from one state to another, it is critical that they consult with attorneys licensed to practice in the new state to review their wills and estate planning documents. I guess, is there someone you know, that wants to sort of talk about you know, you know, how that factors into, like sort of you, you've had this team, you built this trust, you did this work, you know, and now you got this new team member, I guess. Is there something you want to address there? Yeah, I, I would say that, you know, we often think about it as the concept of a collaborative team, right? And starting to bring in that other perspective, because that is really important, right? To make sure that um, the, the estate structures are um, are current within the, the state that we're living in. And so I would, uh, the way that I would personally take in, and then I'll definitely open it up for Brad and Richard to add anything is really look for um, those, uh, for, from the individual donor perspective, the um, uh, really look for like key changes in your life as triggers to do some of this planning. And the same is true for the advisor. So when you hear about these moves, how can you proactively ask that question? And really what a value add, something as simple as, as that is a value add because it might've slipped someone's mind. And again, it's those little things that, that start to add the, the trust there. So I think that that's really, that, that's really um, an important question that I see. And I know that I, you know, I don't want to hog the whole show. I know that I really talked about it from the family legacy perspective, but I really, Brad, any, or Richard, anything, I know that you all work with advisors every day, anything that you would see either just in general or from this intergenerational wealth perspective um, as you've worked with different advisors, because I know that that's a large portion of our audience as well. Richard, I'll, uh, I'll hop in here and then feel free to add. So Heather, I think you, you hit on a lot of it and, and really it's, it's knowing your clients, asking those questions, getting to know, you know, whether it's the future generations, whether it's the spouse, whether it's, you know, broadening that relationship outside of just the immediate kind of one-to-one -one relationship, I think is really what we see advisors moving more towards. So maybe you had the relationship with one spouse for, you know, 20 years. Now it's how do we, we, we see those stats that you reiterated in the presentation, the, the 68 trillion and then 8 trillion over the next five years. So 
really how do you prepare yourself and it's really expanding that relationship developing the trust with the with the children with the heirs with the spouse and you know that's that's really where we see a lot of the advisors we're working with focus their time in in this space richard anything more you would add there no, I, I think you guys covered it really well. I think the problem from time to time is people view this as somewhat intuitive and this is something, well, of course this is being done. And I think it's important uh, to refer back to this presentation. There are two great handouts that if you need, please reach out to me or Brad and we'll get those out to you. But the example that Heather provided of how she worked with her mom and her advisor, I think that's a scenario that every advisor should seek out. And obviously with much more positive outcomes than the experience that like Heather had, I think the earlier that you can interact with heirs, the greater likelihood that you're going to retain more of those assets. And obviously, which I think is more important, is retaining the right heirs. Because uh, a lot of times you'll end up getting uh, certain heirs and they won't exactly be the type of client you want to work with. So I think thinking about all that, working together, always keeping charitable as a key important component. I know ESG has gotten all the headlines these days, but charitable giving is huge for younger generations as well. So always keep that in mind and we all look forward to working with you. And I'll just echo that one point, Richard, too, that um, you know, being proactive about those conversations is extraordinarily helpful because even with the charitable planning side, you know, you know, if you know someone starts you know, from the next generation comes to you with a question or a concern, you know, and that's the first interaction you're having with them you know, that's not necessarily ideal, you know, you would much rather be able to set the groundwork, you know, you know, put out there, um, you know, the framework and the, and the background and, to, and the story of what this uh, interaction has been over the decades or, or years. And, um, and, and so, so that when questions come up or concerns come up, you know, as transitions are happening, you know, it's not, um, you know, it's not the first time you're you're engaging, you know, because that it is just it's harder to address things there. So um, I appreciate that point. And I'll just um, echo a little bit further, Tom, um, when I was talking about that Cerulli data of, earlier in the presentation of the 84 trillion that's going to transfer, um, 72 trillion will go directly to beneficiaries, 12 trillion will go to charities is what the projection is. And so just how critical it is to ask about that charitable connection and how the family wants to do this in an organized legacy fashion is just going to be really key as we go forward. And I'm not seeing any more questions in the, in the chat, so I don't know if um, you're ready to close us out, Pragya, or? Yeah, I think... Uh... We're pretty good here. Thank you again, um, Heather, Brad, and Richard, and FPA, um, Anthony, uh, and Jen, thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to talk about this important topic. And again, like I said earlier, um, feel free to reach out to any of us here at the Community Foundation. Um, we can help your clients with any uh, to meet their uh, or achieve their charitable uh, goals. So thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.